So today, uh, I start to wrap up this six-week series, and it's called Israel, the Church, and God's Endgame, part one, and next week, part two. And we've even geared the whole worship service next week, some very powerful music and intercessory music that we're going to do to wrap this series up as we celebrate and learn more about our roots, our origins. We've talked a lot about what was. Now I want to talk about today what is and what's coming. And then next week I'm going to be talking about the future, and you're going to want to hear about it. Um, I had a young person uh, ask a question and go, well, I hear all this news. Jesus is coming back any day or any month or year. Uh, That's exciting, but I would like to finish high school and I'd like to get married and have a family too. Is that going to cut that all short? Not necessarily. I'll just, that's bait for next week. Okay. Uh, People don't realize this world's going to go on, but now I'm getting into next week. Um, So today... Israel has an earthly role. Here's the thing. The church, we know that God's trying to create one new man. The spiritual man is the church. The natural Israel has a natural earthly destiny. Everything through their history, prophetically, came to be what we have. But we have a spiritual calling and a spiritual mission. And it is different. They're related, but it's different than Israel. Israel has a natural destiny on this planet, a natural history God's going to use. And we're going to talk about that today. And then we're going to flip and talk about the church and its role and how the two are working together. Now, Ephesians 3 verse 10 says, God's intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. God's going to use the church to knock down the spiritual rulers over nations, over cities, to cancel the power of darkness working by the Holy Spirit and his grace and, and pave the way for the coming of Christ. We are going to be dealing with this battle in the spiritual realm like Moses when he was fighting the Amalekites with Israel in the Old Testament. And he said he was holding up his hands and People were holding his hands up, his servants with him. And as he held up his hands in the spiritual dimension, powers were pushed back. But in the natural dimension, there were people swinging swords in the real historical way fight. The two worked together. And that is what I'm going to talk about. Israel's natural destiny and how important it is. Some people go, Israel, God's done with Israel. Jesus came now. They blew it. They backslid. He's done. Uh, uh, Uh-uh-uh. He has an amazing destiny for them. So here's it. So we're going to show and deal with the spiritual aspect of everything. We're told to look up, watch, be ready. He's coming. God's end game, what is it? One new man, Ephesians 2.15, by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commandments. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, the natural and the spiritual, making peace. Who wrote this? None other than Apostle Paul. By the way, his name used to be Saul. You know what Saul means? Asked for what people want big. That's what his name means. God changed his name to Paul. You know what Paul's name means? One word small. (laughs) A guy who did maybe the most ever small. In fact, when I think of the story of Israel through all human history and even till now versus America that's been around for 250 years, the greatest nation probably since Israel, a Christian nation, were barely mentioned in the Bible. Why? Small. God's purpose, it's huge, but it's important. And we'll be talking about some of that. But anyhow, um, so we see we've covered our roots where we are. What's next for Israel? You can look at the news. You can look at prophecy. You can see it's going somewhere. What's next for Israel? What's next for Israel? We're talking about We're at the door um, of a great, great war. And God's purpose is going to be, and we're going to talk about God's purpose among the nations with Israel. What's he going to do? Just like we're dealing with the spiritual entities in the heavenlies and in our lives and in this world, Israel is going to historically uh, be in a giant war. And God's going to use the nation of Israel to magnify his name to all the nations on the stage of human history. He's going to do it. And this is how he's going to do it in a great war that's right around the corner. I'll show you how around the corner it is. But let's go into Ezekiel 38. 
This will be the fastest rush job I've ever done on Ezekiel 38 because I could teach on it for weeks. Instead, I'm going to spend about 10, 12 minutes on it. Uh, here's Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36 and 37 talks about the regathering of Israel into their own land. And then 37 talks about the valley of the dry bones. We sing rattle, and these dry bones come together. And he said, that's the whole house of Israel. All these bones come together in a skeleton, and then flesh come on it, and then a heart comes in. It talks about the restoration of Israel. And, but then Ezekiel 38 says, this is what's next, because we've seen those things. We've seen the regathering of Israel. I'll talk about that. We've seen them come to this amazing place. But now what's next? Uh, this is what's going to happen. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 8. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, said, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Some historians think that it was the actual name of a huge tribal uh, leader. Other theologians think it was a, uh, a fallen angelic spirit or a demonic spirit with huge, huge power. He says, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and bring you with your whole army, horses, horsemen, fully armed, a great horde of large and small shields, all brandishing swords. Persia, which is Iran, Cush, and Put will be among them with all the shields and helmets, also Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togarma from the far north with all its troops, and many nations around with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes around you, take command of them. After many days you will be called to arms in the latter days. Okay, we know we're in the latter days, but he says in the latter days, the end of time, you will invade a land that's recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been long desolate. They had now been brought back from all the nations, and now all of them live in safety. So we see he's saying, once you're back in your own land and you're all restored, there's going to be a confederation of nations that doesn't want you around, doesn't want you to exist. And of course, we see all the anti-Semitism on our campuses and worldwide, like it's never been seen even before World War II in all of history. We see the whole world inflamed, inflamed in anti-Semitic uh, activities against the nation of Israel. And there's a confederation right now, these nations, there's a confederation, even with the Eurasian uh, market and union, that with a common goal, a common goal, and they deny Israel, and they're actually gathered from all sides, and they're con con and right now encircling and closing in on the nation of Israel. I know Russia has a, which is uh, the first uh, nation mentioned. I want you to look at this map right here, and you can see all these nations that I mentioned and their names, all their names, all right now are converging on the nation of Israel. There's over 150,000 Russian troops right on Israel's northern border right now, okay? Never in history, this was written 2,600 years ago, and it's happening right in front of your and my eyes in the latter days. In fact, you can see, um, here's the confederation as you look at all those. Uh, I'm gonna give them their modern names so you can see Russia, Ethiopia, Libya, Iran, which is Persia, Turkey, which is uh, uh, all these, uh, I've got to keep hurrying, Beth Togarma. And by the way, Turkey's going to play a huge role here. All the Arab countries. And get this, if you can say this fast five times, I will give you an untold amount of gift cards. <laughs> Kakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan. If you can say that five times fast, you're better than me. Anyhow. And then portions of Europe. These nations are all converging, and they actually have formed a union um, uh, with a goal in mind. And so it says, in the latter days, these nations will converge, and they are going to come down and invade a land, it says, that's recovered from war, whose people are gathered from many nations. And so we see this is happening right now, and for it to happen, Israel... In another verse, it says, it's going to be living with unwalled villages. There are no walls around any of their towns or villages. Um, and it says, in safety, restored back, restored back from the nations where they were dispersed for thousands of years. 
Well, we can see today, just listen to some of this, just real quickly. Israel is restored. No walls around any of its villages. It's one of the top 20 most prosperous nations in the, in the whole world. By the way, there's 195 nations in the world, and they're in the top 20. It's a world superpower, top 10 most powerful nations with military intelligence and an army like no other, and nuclear power, a world superpower, uh, one of the highest and hottest tech markets in the world, medical breakthroughs that are almost miraculous coming through them, one of the largest exporters of fruit in the world, and on track over the next five years to become one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world. So how could this little postage stamp the size of New Jersey have this happen? after thousands of years, other than there's a God in heaven who speaks prophetically and knows the end from the beginning, and we're part of that. And every single word he said in this book thousands of years ago is happening right before our eyes. Listen to Isaiah. 2,600 and some years ago, he says this, Isaiah 35, 1, he says, the wilderness and solitary place will be glad for them. What? The return of Israel from the nations. And the desert will rejoice and blossom as a rose. With the irrigation and the culture, oh, what's second, I think second or third largest exporter of fruit in the whole world. Wow, happened right before our eyes. So anyhow, we see there's huge confederation, anti-Semitic, wants to wipe Israel off the map. They're converging together. Nations that would never even speak to each other before are making alliances together. And they're coming to, to, to have a great war and descend on Israel and take a spoil and take advantage of her rich natural resources, sources, oil, natural gas, and uh, um, tremendous, tremendous uh, food source as well. So anyhow, Ezekiel 38, 15 through 23 says this, you will come from your place in the far north, you and many people with you, riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come against my people like a cloud and cover the land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land. And here it is, one of his purposes with natural Israel. Um, God wants the devil to know. He wants you and me to know. He wants the unsaved world to know. He wants every nation and every head of nation, all of them, to know who he is. He says, so that the nations may know when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days, I would bring you against them. I just said that. So here we see God saying, my purpose is I want everybody to know who they're dealing with, me. Every nation's going to know when they see what happens next. So what's going to happen? Verse 18, and it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. I'm telling you, you don't ever want to see God mad. He says, my fury will come up in my face. He'll be uncontrollable. He is. He says, for in my jealousy and the fire of my wrath, I've spoken surely in that day, there will be a great earthquake. I've studied this. It'll be the biggest earthquake in the history of the world. And so the fish of the sea and the birds in the heavens and beasts of the field and all creeping things on the earth and men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Mountains will be thrown down. Steep places will fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against Gog and all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. The same thing you see over and over in scripture with Israel's enemies. When they went out and they worshiped Israel, what happened? The enemies turned on each other and they self-destructed. When Gideon with just a few people went out and raised up the standard of the torch and shouting God's name, they turned and they destroyed each other. The two factions in Israel of Islam, the Sunni and the Shiite, will destroy each other. They will destroy each other. They're going to self-destruct. I'm telling you that, that, that it's a fact. And I will bring him judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on many people who are with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones that can crush a car. I mean, there's other scriptures in the Bible that talk about this. Fire and brimstone. All the stuff that hit Egypt, not separately, all at once. He says, thus, here he says it again, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, here's the thing. When God says something once, you should pay attention. When he says it again, wow, 
double attention. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, he mentions this. He rants. Forgive me for even saying that, God. He, seven times he says the same thing over and over again. He's, he's just beside himself. He says, when I'm done with this, everybody will know. Here he goes again, Ezekiel 39. Let's go into the next chapter. I will display my glory among the nations, and the nations will see the punishment I inflict on the hand and the hand I lay on them. And here's something very interesting. Now Israel, from that day forward, the people of Israel will know that I'm the Lord their God. And the nations, again, will know that the people of Israel went into exile for their sins because they were unfaithful to me. So I hid my face from them and handed them over to their enemies, and they fell by the sword. Which is, by the way, what's happened to America in the last number of years. God was so disgusted with his sin, he handed us over to our enemies, and we fell into the hands of the devil for the last number of years because of, the, because of chastisement, because of judgment, because of things that we need and deserve. But that doesn't mean God's not that God's finished with us quite yet. And so I'm excited about these things, and God's going to show everybody, I, I deal with people, I deal with nations, and they're going to know why all this stuff happened. And it says, when I brought them back from the nations, I have gathered them in the countries of their enemies, and I will be proved holy through them in the sight of many nations. He just goes on and on seven times. Then they'll know I am the Lord their God. Though I sent them into exile among the nations, I'll gather them into their own land, not leaving any behind, and I will no longer hide my face from them. I'll pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, says the sovereign Lord. Oh, so God's going to magnify his name on human history, on the stage of human history through Israel. There's going to be amazing, amazing miracle working with the intercessory power and worship of the church and his divine power. He's going to directly intervene in human affairs. He's going to come in when Israel's about to be wiped out and he's going to destroy everything, everything. And uh, it, it gets, I didn't get into it much. You can read it and study it yourself, but I get into just enough so that you can see this. And then again, he says, I will make myself known in the sight of many nations and magnify my name among the nations. And Israel will know why everything that's happened to them has happened. I pray we figure it out here too, amen? amen. So, <laughs> Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says. 31, seven through nine. This is what they'll sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the chief, the foremost of the nations. Chief, it says in one foremost, make your praises heard and say, the Lord save your people to rend them. In the end, Israel is gonna be chief among all the nations. That little postage stamp will be the epicenter of the whole earth and the whole world. And guess what? A divine, you've always heard the statement, a dictatorship from hell. This is gonna be a dictatorship from heaven. And it says, Zechariah 14, nine, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Boy, do I look forward to that. That's a new age that's right around the corner. Now, so that is just a brief thing. You can study it yourself, but God intends to deal with the spiritual principalities and powers, it says, by the church. He's gonna deal with the natural, with the nations. He's gonna reveal himself through Israel on the world stage, and everybody's going to know who, he's going, who he is, natural and spiritual. You're going to see that at that time. After that, there'll be a huge revival in Israel. I'll talk about that next week, and the whole nation's going to get saved in one day. How could it be? But we pray for these things. And you say, God, this is pretty freaky stuff you're talking about. Well, did you ever think about COVID-19? Anybody ever dream six years ago that that would happen, that the whole world would be shut down? And that God would fire a warning shot over the stage of human history and say, get ready, get serious. I'm coming back. Everything's changing. And we see that it has. So where are we at? I want to switch gears now. And I want to talk about the church. Uh, and I want to talk about you and me and our role during this time. This battle, whether it's going to be fought, some people say that it's going to be, some scholars say it's going to be at the beginning of the tribulation period of seven years because Israel's going to be burying dead bodies and using the, their, all the equipment for fuel for the next seven years. Some people say this battle is going to mark, be, mark the beginning of a tribulation period after a time of peace. Other prophetic scholars say this is at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. I really 
don't know for sure because everybody I respect, half of them believe one and half of them believe the other. This is the deal. Prophecy is interesting because it can't be fully defined till it happens. So you don't need to worry about the rapture, pre, mid, post. All you need to be, know is when it happens, I'm going. And you need to, even time, every time you see another prophecy fulfilled and they're happening, it's happening all the time, all the time. Just you're one more step assured that you're on the right track and that he's coming and there's this expectation that rises. We don't need to know the exact time, but I do want you to know this is what's coming right around the corner. And God's going to do powerful things as he gets ready to return. Now, our role, I want to talk about that in the few minutes that I have left. Uh, everything we had came through Israel, everything. And I don't need to go over that again. But now the shoe is on the other foot. The shoe's on the other foot. And we've entered a period, and we're at the end of it now, called the times of the Gentiles. Now, Jesus said something very interesting so we can know the times. I want you all to remember the times of the Gentiles. What is it? The times of the Gentiles is when God turned away from Israel in her unbelief and turned everything to the nations, to all Gentiles. The Gentiles, anyone who's not a Jew. Okay, and he says, and, and when did this happen? And what did he say about the times of the Gentiles? It's a period of time when God favors the whole world with the gospel and the good news that was once only offered to Israel until it's time, it says, for that to end and God begins to favor Israel again. And this is what, get this, when did that start? Okay, I don't have much time, so I'll just tell you. Peter in Acts chapter 10 is on a roof. He's hungry. He's, while he's there having his devotions and hungry, waiting for, for lunch, he falls into a trance and he has a vision. He sees a huge sheet come down from heaven with all kinds of unclean animals like uh, pigs and other things that Israel was forbidden to eat, unclean things. Uh, and a voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, only Peter will disagree with God and say, no, I, I don't understand him. I'll maybe see him someday. He says, no, Lord, because the law says, and he says, don't call what I've cleansed common. In other words, that whole thing got cleaned up in Christ. You don't have to follow that. You can have barbecued spare ribs, pork baby back ribs, Peter. It's done. It's done. Barbecue sauce the whole nine yards. It's that whole thing is passed away, that system. Don't call what I've cleansed common because the unclean represented the unclean nations and the Gentiles and everyone outside of the commonwealth of Israel. And, and three times this happened. There's that three again. And Peter's wondering about that. And then some guys downstairs knocking the door, and a, a bunch of Gentiles, Romans, were knocking on the door and said, hey, we want you to come and preach for us. The Holy Spirit said, go with him. He goes with him. He, pre he talks about Jesus. While he's talking, they all get saved. The Holy Spirit falls on them. They all start praying in their prayer language. And he, he goes, <laughs> okay. And they baptized him. And then he told the apostles and they realized, oh man, God is offering salvation to the whole world, not just to the commonwealth of Israel. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, don't you remember that all of us were strangers to the commonwealth of Israel and its heritage? But now in Christ, we're all who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the times of the Gentiles started when God decided to offer it to everybody. But then the end of it, get this, Jesus said something cool because the disciple says, when are the last days? When are you coming back? He had three signs, but one of them was this. He said this. He says, Jerusalem, Luke 21, 24, they'll fall by the sword and be taken prisoners to all nations. That happened with their disbursement. We've seen that Holocaust and everything. And it says, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles till the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So the times of the Gentiles has wound down and is being totally fulfilled and it's time for God to favor the nation of Israel. There's a giant switch happening in human history, and you're gonna see an epic rise of Israel, an epic rise as we decrease. They will increase and they will decrease. And, uh, and, but, but we won't go away, we won't go away. And I have a, a whole podcast on signs of the times that you, you can look up on YouTube. But this is an amazing thing. So this period of time has come to an end. And the times that, till Jerusalem, it says, till Jerusalem uh, 
is reoccupied by the Jewish nation and the Gentiles are driven out, that's this period of time. Well, look what happened. Israel became a nation after 1900 years in May 14, 1948. In the Six Day War, they got Jerusalem back. In 1968, they declared a new holiday, a Hebrew date on which the divided city of Jerusalem became one under total control. And then on December 6, 2017, former President Trump declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. They are completely back and the times of the Gentiles are behind us and it's now you are gonna see a huge switch. Things are gonna happen at breathtaking speed and I don't want us to miss anything. And God has a parallel plan for us and for the United States as well. And many of the things that happened with Israel, there are shadows and parallels that come in to our nation and to our, into our roots and our background and they're pretty, pretty great. Uh, I might even add with a short bunny trail um, when uh, our former president declared Jerusalem capital of Israel, uh, I would just say this, anyone who stands for Jerusalem will prosper and they'll be secure and they'll be really hard to kill until God's done with them. Especially when you consider the echo that some prophetic ministries are saying, get this, that God has further plans possibly for this man that did this, even though it's all about God's kingdom and not a man. Uh, I, I heard a study from a couple of pro, pro, um, prophetic ministries that compared the Leviticus 8 anointing of a high priest for a new role with the attempted assassination of our former president. That's an echo perhaps into our history. In Leviticus 8, they were supposed to put blood on the tip of the right ear of a new high priest. And then they had to put blood on his thumb which you've all seen raised in every most popular picture you've seen. And then it said you had to take off his shoes and get blood on his feet. You remember here, remember in watching that report, go, where are my shoes, where are my shoes? They're saying there's a direct correlation between that, that sends an echo into the fact that perhaps God might not be done with us yet and might have further plans for us that are far greater than of course, just a man. And uh, I hope so. Even that man with all his imperfections, God may have a plan. And guess what? Maybe you in all your imperfections, he may have a plan for you. This is a non-political announcement, unpaid for, and my name is Pastor Doug Bergsman. I approve this message. The times of the Gentiles are winding down. The gospel's being preached to all the nations. Sign number two, Jesus said, when that happens, the end will come. Well, guess what? Just our little church is preaching the gospel in 150 nations on YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp. We're making our mark, not to speak of people with far greater influence than we have. And the gospel due to technology and the work of the Holy Spirit and an omnipresent God is going across the whole world. Sign number two. And so I just want to say next week, uh, it's going to be an exciting week. The job of the church, starting with that day on the roof with Peter and Paul and the apostles, is almost over. And we need to work harder than ever before because the church's mission is almost over in this dimension. And it will be soon time for us to leave. I'll talk more about that next week. Meanwhile, the Hebrew writer says this, and we're doing this today. Hebrews 10, 25, don't give up. Meeting together as some have are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. First Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. He said that 19 years, 100 years ago. <laughs> Therefore, be alert and sober in mind that you may pray. Second Peter 3, my last scripture. Seeing all these things are going to be dissolved, then what manner of persons are you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening. It's a floating day, remember. Our godly prayer repents, becoming who we are and doing what we've been called to do. We'll hasten the floating day and God will fix a day. Hastening the coming of the day of God when the heavens being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. You beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace 
without spot and blameless. The only security in this last day, and everything could change within a day, everything could change within a day, is the ark. And the ark is the end time body of Christ. It preserved Noah and his family and gave them a new beginning on the flood waters. The ark preserved Moses as he floated on his deliverance ministry down the Nile River. And the end time ark is the body of Christ. It's a shelter from the storm. It's a shelter from the horrors of everything that's come. It's a plan reserved for you and me. And if you're not right with God today and you're tired, you're scared, Somebody's scared because I got this word scared in my head and you're scared about what to do and you're full of anxiety. Just turn your life completely over to Jesus and just say, Jesus, forgive all my sins. I want to be in your family. I want to be in the ark. I want to be a child of God. I want that assurance that I have absolute security in eternal life and in a plan and a future you have for me and you have me. You have my back. You've got me, God. You say, Pastor, how I do that? You just ask him. You just say, Jesus, forgive my sins. I believe in you. I believe in what you did for me. I believe this message. And I just want you to come into my heart. And when that happens, the supernatural peace of God that passes understanding will flood your heart and you'll be born again. Every head bowed, every eye closed online. If you're watching and you want to pray a prayer that will change your life and have God visit you in your room, just put your hand over your heart and get ready to pray. Here, we're not going to call anyone forward. But if that's you, and you want to leave here today knowing that you're right with God, just for a moment, we'll all pray together in a minute. Don't be self-conscious, but raise your hand real high and put it back down. Don't miss this moment to get right. I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand over here. God bless you. Oh, pray this prayer with me. We'll all pray it together. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I'm going to need your grace. I believe you died on the cross for me. And you rose again. I ask you into my heart. Forgive my sins and make me your child. I receive your grace. Thank you for saving me. I will follow you. Lord, I pray for every person here and online who asked you into their heart. We cancel the devil's plan for them in Jesus' name. Open up a new and living way for them. Reveal yourself through your word and your spirit to them and help them walk in everything you have for them. As far as the rest of us, Lord, help us to pray every day for our country, for Israel, for your spiritual and your natural purposes on the stage of human history. Lord, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, we ask you, Lord, stir us up to godliness so that we can can work while it's yet day. Lord, and let every one of us, Lord, be, Lord, I pray for a spirit of peace and unity and security on this beautiful family that we have. Lord, preserve our lives, preserve our longevity, and help us fully accomplish our mission, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Give God a hand and thank him for his grace.